I was cast as the misfit. I was cast as the freak, the creative, you know, the art, the art kid, you know, in theater. Um, I, I, I had, luckily I had, you know, a, a band of other misfits that, that sort of helped to support me and really helped, I think all of us to sort of like, you know, form and, and start carving out our identities. Um, you know, it's, it was, it was an interesting time. You know, I, I, I started high school at the, at the end of the eighties and, and went through the early nineties. And it was an interesting time in culture because there was this sort of um, embrace of counterculture, alternative music, um, you know, fashion, you know, really started blowing up and entering the, the larger sort of zeitgeist of popular culture. Um, it was it was sort of the first time that it felt okay to be queer, to be different. Um, so not that I was without those scars or challenges or, or, or conflicts that every young person goes through. But I think, you know, we were fortunate at that time because there was this overarching sense of embracing the weird or embracing the different. And I mean, that's really what, I think that's a big reason why I fell so in love with fashion in the way that I did because of, you know, what it represented. And okay, what did it represent? You know, I think, you know, seeing seeing people that looked different, again, I think especially in that, in that sweet spot of the late eighties, early nineties, you know, you had the supermodel boom, you started to see behind the curtain. Um, I mean, and, and thanks to you and thanks to the work that you did. And like, thanks to sort of, you know, always searching my cable box and, and having a VHS uh, tape ready to record, you know, we so sort of- fun that we, our stories intersect like that. Anyway, it's, <laughs> it was just, you know, growing up in a place like St. Louis, as you can imagine at the time, you know, pre-internet, um, we had a really different access to culture than I think young folks have now. And we really had to seek it out. So, um, you know, fashion to me, and especially like seeing, you know, maybe seeing queer designers, um, you know, seeing these really like creative voices in that industry, um, seeing that they were able to do it, seeing that they were able to sort of like uh, transmute their experience and go into this larger group and to belong, it, it, it felt very hopeful. Um, to me as a young person, it made me think, oh, maybe, maybe that's my tribe. Maybe that, maybe these are my people. I, I, I need to keep my eye on that. And, and that is really what I think started the trajectory of leaving St. Louis, going to Chicago, starting to work in the industry, moving to New York. And, and, and it, it, it put this dream in my head that was more real. You know, the dream had more of a reality. Um, all of a sudden it had more of a reality to it because I saw other people that felt a little bit more like me. And then, you know, from a, from a model and a casting and an image and a pop culture moment, you know, post supermodels into grunge, you know, models like Kristen McMenemy, um, you know, models like Kate Moss, Ed, Ed Sabal, like all of these sort of like outsiders that became part of that sort of sphere of influence. And then I was like, oh, okay, well, if these sort of weirdos and freaks and misfits can do it, you know, maybe I can as well. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, and when Kristen's eyebrows got shaved off, what did you do? <laughs> I mean, I shaved, I shaved mine off. It was, it was so funny. I mean, years later working, working with Francois Nars and working you know, I had an opportunity to be on set with Kristen when we, when Francois was shooting a campaign for, for the NARS brand while I was there. And it was such a full circle moment for me and a little embarrassing and a little mortifying. You know, he, he sort of told Kristen, oh my God, can you believe that he shaved his eyebrows off? Um, but it was such a moment, you know, there was this, it was, it was very empowering. I think in the same way that I looked to maybe musical icons like Bowie, um, and, you know, Freddie Mercury, Annie Lennox, Madonna, like all the, it, you, you saw these shape shifters and these really expressive artists in music culture, but you hadn't really seen them in fashion. And then starting to see all of these references that I understood and these nods to different eras and these nods to classic film and 
yeah, again, that moment when, when Francois shaved Kristen's eyebrows off backstage at an Anna Sui show, literally because it, her brows were too big to sort of take the, the look, which was inspired by the 20s, he shaved them off. And then I, you know, then everyone's eyebrows got thin, you know, like every, you know, Kevin, Carol yeah. Shaw, uh, you know, any, any of the makeup artists that were working backstage were starting to like over tweeze the eyebrows. Everyone's eyebrows were thin. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it too. This is cool. That's so funny. Um, I'm glad they grew back. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just thinking about something and, and, you know, maybe it's too complicated to talk about, but you know, I'm thinking a lot about my project and the documentary and my ongoing project. And, and I'm thinking about coding and that, you know, fashion television, because you were watching it, um, it. It's not that we were saying things, but we were showing things. So I, how aware, because it, it, there was coded representation. Yes. Yeah. Queerness. And like, do you remember what you might've picked up? Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, I think that's, again, it's like, it's hard for me. And I know when we've sort of had this conversation previously, it's hard for me to pick like specific moments because I think, you know, my brain and, and I guess maybe the way my brain works, I've just collected all of these like influences and references and they sort of go into my brain, which is like a big blender and it comes out the other side as whatever it is. But I, again, I think, you know, building on that idea of representation and, and I agree with you, you, you know, what was, what was amazing about fashion television and amazing about like any, anybody who was doing something like that at that time, which really was, was not really anyone, uh, but what you were doing, it, it, it showed something, it presented, uh, it presented something without bias and without a lot of uh, extraneous narration. So I feel like what that meant on the receiving end, what that meant for me perhaps was it, it was just visibility, you know, it was just representation. And I think, again, when you, when you, you know, we know how the media works, we know how, um, you know, especially as like, you know, 30, almost 30 years in the business and understanding how marketing works and understanding how publicists and PR and communications and how everyone's always crafting a narrative. I think what was really interesting at that moment of what, what fashion television was doing really was just presenting, presenting without commentary and, and the viewer, you know, the queer kids on the other side in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, the, the, the bored housewife who had never had access to this really glamorous world, like saw something presented in a, in a way that was just um, honest. And, and I guess that for me felt, again, it, it felt like, um, it felt like visibility. It felt like seeing something that I didn't maybe know how to express. I think a lot of what happens with queer people and young people in general, and I think this happens with 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 creatives. I'm sort of experiencing this and have experienced this in my career. You know, we we have to find our shared language in order to communicate. And this, you know, that moment and that coverage and that exposure to that world helped me build my vocabulary, helped me build this language that then wow. helped me communicate to other people like me to find strength, find solidarity, find community. And, and that is, I think, what I imagine and knowing talking to you ab about your ongoing project, like this is what that moment meant for all of these people. It, it united us in a way that we felt more powerful or empowered and, and safe. And now, you know, young folks and everyone does that via the internet. We do that on social media. We do that in different ways than we did in the late eighties, early nineties. But I think it gave a sense of community more than anything. So there, so you had your VHS tapes, but you also went to the library. I'm sure that people now would find that very, you, you, you hope to be able to save up for a magazine. The oh, oh my God. It was like, you know, we had, I think we had two booksellers you know, in the general like St. Louis area. And this was, this was more downtown, you know, in our like cosmopolitan area and which was about 45 minutes, you know, an hour from where I lived. And, you know, we had, like I said, we had to seek it out. You would go to the, I had a great library that I was in probably three to four days a week, just, you know, absorbing reference, looking through old, um, you know, art books and photography books and learning about all of these people, you know, learning about Irving Penn, learning, learning about, um, you know, all of these people. And then, 
connecting the dots on their references, you know, borrowing films from the library, you know, renting movies from Blockbuster or like the video store and sure. yeah, going to saving my pennies, you know, saving, saving my money, which I didn't have any as a, as a high school student, um, saving money so that I could splurge on a copy of Italian Vogue and see Mizell and see Verushka and see Lauren Hutton and Isabella Rossellini. And, um, you know, that was really like, I think the moment. And then that, you know, again, I started, I, I think I became like an avid consumer and an, uh, like I was hungry for fashion sometime around that time, you know, 87, 88, 89. I don't really remember exactly when it started, but it was, it was very much in tandem of what, what you were doing, all of the like Paris couture shows that you were covering. And, um, but yeah, we had to, we, you know, we couldn't just get on our phone or on our laptop or, you know, walking down a street that, that has, you know, 15 different booksellers, you know, there was one destination, one place, you know, you had a library, you had a bookstore, um, and then you had whatever you were lucky enough to catch on TV, which, you know, that was you another- had to be home to watch it to be, at the right time. Home. We didn't have a DVR. We didn't have, like, we didn't have on demand. So like, if, you know, thinking about like, okay, when is, when is fashion TV on? When is style with Elsa Clinch on, you know, later when it began, like, you know, when, when Cindy did house of style and, and, and things became, you know, sort of happened later, you would get things on entertainment tonight later, but you had to, you had to have your calendar sort of marked so that you wouldn't miss those moments. Have a TV guide, imagine. <laughs> oh my God. A t and TV guide was another one of those things. Like that was TV guide was one of the things that, that, that I grew up with. I mean, everyone in my generation, I'm sure grew up with. So, you know, my mom wasn't a, a, a very fashion conscious woman. So like the publications that we had coming into the, to the house, whatever my mom had on subscription was like Reader's Digest, you know, Women's World and TV Guide, you know, maybe People Magazine. So, but TV Guide was, was a, a great one. And I, I literally, every time TV Guide came, I would literally go through with the highlighter and I would highlight everything that I wanted to watch. And I kept TV Guide literally in my bedroom, you know, like as, as long as I can remember, honestly, um, you know, even when I was, you know, a, a, a really young kid, like I remember making sure that I was catching like solid gold and, you know, American bandstand and, and, and anything, anything that was, you know, pop cultural related, I was obsessed with. Yeah. And you were obsessed with beauty. Can you, can you, tell me about that like what and I mean you spent a lot of your life making people really really beautiful <laughs> so what 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 what's the essence of that what's the kernel there I think again you know I guess for me it all comes down to this identity this this part of your identity and I think again when you're when you're queer and you're questioning who you are and you feel like an outsider you know you maybe feel different from the, the world around you um you look for things that inspire you and that feel, that sort of facilitate that dream, that imagination. And I think for me, you know, beauty became the thing that I focused on. Um, I, I don't, not necessarily by accident, but it wasn't my, my focus when, when I, um, you know, started loving Hollywood and loving music and loving pop culture and loving fashion and all of that. I, I knew that I liked that, um, transformational element, I think is really what beauty is. I loved this idea of you take somebody who looks like me or looks like you and you have hair and makeup and wardrobe and lighting and background and, and scenery and character and performance and you put it all together and it becomes this like elusive sort of illustrious magical thing that then you see on celluloid or on you know the pages of a magazine or in an art gallery, whatever. And that was what was attractive to me, this idea that you could become whatever you wanted to become. And I think as I learned, you know, growing up and, and coming of age and, and, you know, trying to find ways to express yourself with no money, you know, buying thrift clothes, um, shaving your eyebrows off, coloring your hair, wearing makeup, wearing jewelry, using accessories to portray on the outside how I felt like maybe I, you know, how I, how I wanted to feel or how I felt in, on the inside. So beauty became this catalyst of expression. And when I learned that it could become this 
catalyst for personal expression, but then also a way to help other people express themselves. That became really fascinating and interesting to me. And then as I, you know, again, so in a big way because of the exposure to fashion television and that, you know, what I saw, I was like, oh, there are people that are makeup artists. There are people that are hairstylists that do this. There are people that are like lighting designers. There, This is actually an industry that I can um, go into. So I sort of morphed into beauty when I was in college in Chicago. I was studying um, costume design and just studio art. Um, I, I didn't have, I, you know, literature. I was, I was sort of in the arts, the arts adjacent world, but makeup and beauty really came just by accident because a, a schoolmate of mine was doing an independent film. Her, her boyfriend at the time got a little bit of money. I think he got 10 or $15,000 to, to film uh, a, a script that he wrote and they needed someone to do hair, makeup and costumes. And I said, yes, I can do it. And that was I how my career out. started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. So then, I mean, there were probably some, st you did a little bit of maybe a little bit more film work, but how did you find yourself backstage and or on sets? And I mean, like, it's still one of those things that I think about and I, you know, I still have that pinch me, you know, moment. And, and it's, and it's, I'm, I'm thankful that it's something that I've never lost in my, in my work because I was so grateful and so lucky to land sort of where I landed at the time that I did. You know, the timing was perfect for when I sort of entered the industry in Chicago. It was the mid nineties. Um, you know, I, I guess I started working, you know, not just being a student and, and sort of thinking about beauty and makeup as a career, 90, 96. And it was that explosion um, in beauty, you know, at that moment when every, all of these makeup artists that were working backstage in the industry were starting their own lines. So you had, Janine LaBelle at Stila, which was actually the first makeup brand that I worked with, first artist I worked with, Francois Nars at Nars, um, Lorac by Carol Shaw, Bobby Brown, Trish McAvoy, Laura Mercier. You had all of these people that had fashion credentials that were then starting their own brands. You know, we see that now in a different way with indie, indie beauty brands, but they were the first indie beauty brands and they were challenging the status quo of what these big corporations you know, like Shiseido or Lauder or Lancome were, were sort of defining. And I thought what was so powerful about that moment was that it was, a, again, it was a different voice. It was not this sort of like corporate commercialized um, industry point of view about what beauty is, but these artists were presenting options of what beauty could be. And I just landed at the right moment at the right time. I, I figured out that I could work at a makeup counter uh, to supplement my income when I wasn't doing film or television or stage projects, which, you know, were few and far between. And for like a 19, 20 year old who didn't know what he was doing, but was just saying yes um, to get my foot in the door, I started working on the retail side and was fortunate enough to meet um, Janine early on in my career. And she believed in me. And then, you know, meeting the team at NARS and meeting Francois. And then I, I started working at Barney's in Chicago. And then it just sort of moved from there, um, always marrying sort of the retail side as, you know, um, with the sort of industry side. So I, I, I had my hand in both. So this is to say, never underestimate that kid at the Sephora who might be doing your makeup. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's one of the things that, you know, I've, I've, I've been in, in this industry for a long time and I've done a lot of different things and, you know, starting from my my own work as a makeup artist and then and then assisting and working with with other makeup artists which again it's 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 still a dream i can't believe i've been able to work with the people i have um, but then as i've as i've worked more on the brand side and worked with education and communication and product development for me it's always the most inspiring thing to meet those kids in the middle of nowhere glamour obsessed, beauty obsessed. And, and it is like makeup is, it's such a, it's such a, um, it's a gateway to, to imagination. And, you know, I see this with younger people, kids, you know, nieces and nephews, um, you know, young kids that my friends have and their um, gravitation towards beauty, because again, it's expression, it's, it's crayons, it's markers, it's um, oil pastels. It's a way that you can literally transform 
um, how you feel. And it's literally a way that you can show the rest of the world um, who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you worked on set. So you, you got, you, you moved away from retail and you were suddenly with Stila and Nars and you were on sets backstage. Tell me about that period or in corporate with Nars. And it's, it's interesting because it's like, it was one of those things, you know, like I, I left St. Louis to go to Chicago and I was, I went for college. I didn't finish college. I, I dropped out because I started working and it was, you know, I, I sort of made the decision because I had a couple of experience, those early experiences. You know, I remember telling my dad, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to quit school because I have an opportunity to work. And I've met people and there's some producers and, you know, blah, 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 people that will hire me. So I'm going to I'm going to go for it. Um, the how so the, was he? What's that? Was he upset? Um. No, I mean, he actually was, I think he was impressed that I actually had like a direction and an idea and that I was going to commit to something and I was going to see where it, where, where it landed. And, you know, I, I, I was incredibly committed to, I mean, I, it became my focus, like everything that I, everything that I could do, um, to, to make that dream a reality, I, I did. Um, and, and in Chicago, I think, you know, it being a smaller city and, and, and really at the time, especially in the mid to late nineties, Chicago was really, um, a center of television and independent film. So I was doing, I wasn't really doing fashion work to begin. I was, I was doing it when I could, I was doing, you know, the, um, catalogs for Montgomery wards or Marshall fields, or, you know, you would, and the catalog work was the, was the, was the, was the, the best paying work. So we all tried to get it. Um, I was assisting, you know, at the time too. So again, whatever I could do to make money and keep it going, but I always wanted the fashion piece. I tried my best, you know, with, with like agency representation and connecting the dots and networking within the community in Chicago, it was just not really happening. So when I moved to New York, because of my relationship with NARS and because of my relationship with the NARS brand and with Francois and started to have the opportunity to work backstage, you know, work on shows, um, work on shoots that were really with the models and the designers and the hairstylists and the photographers that I had seen, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is a dream come true. So there was a little bit of a transition between Chicago and New York where I, I was, you know, I would come to New York, um, during New York Fashion Week to like help with the shows. And then we would, there would also be usually a retail activation tied to that. We would do a big event at Barney's or Saks. And then there would be like a brand education moment, maybe where we had like a training conference and we would learn or help to teach about like the next season's launches. Um, so then that was like probably 2000, 2001. And then 2003, I moved to New York and then started really to, I think gain entrance into the industry. I was um, assisting Ayako Yoshimura, who was the um, basically the director of artistry for NARS at the time. And she worked directly with Francois. And that was how my career then really took off because I started working with her on all of her editorial and campaigns and fashion shows. And then when she wasn't available, I would sometimes work with her clients. And then that started sort of my own, you know, my own career. And then luckily because of the NARS brand and their support and, you know, it, it was a very small independent brand that was acquired by a big group, which was, they were acquired by Shiseido in 2000. So that like 2000 to 2006, 2007, I think moment in the brand's history was um, finally all of us that sort of had like worked in some capacity with the brand had a regular paycheck we had um more opportunities and and that was sort of how it all it all sort of built i guess from there so when you were started to be in new york in those in those environments did you just act really cool like you didn't oh. <laughs> it's funny because i like i i guess for whatever reason and maybe this is like where my like double Virgo nature like serves me is that I like, I was able to like keep it together, even though I was like losing it inside. I had had a couple of moments in Chicago that I think prepared me for it in a way, nothing 
you know, I remember, you know, I, you know, my first super, you know, my first supermodel. And so I was at Barney's, I was working at Barney's in Chicago at the time. And Christy Turlington had, was, was at the time she was launching uh, her skincare line, Sundari, and we carried it at Barney's. So Christy and the other two founders of the Sundari brand came to Chicago came to Barney's to do like a clinic to like introduce all of us that worked at the store to the brand. And I was basically like dying because Christy is my favorite, like hands down my favorite model of all time. Like just, I, I, I don't even, I can't even fathom that there's like a more beautiful face that was ever constructed on earth. Just everything. (laughs) So she came to do the clinic and she came to do the, you know, basically like teach us about the product and, and all of that. And she was doing a little bit of press, local press uh, at the store. And I, you know, I got to like do her makeup and like touch her up for on camera, which was like, you know, I'll never forget what I did because, you know, NARS um, had this very iconic product at the time called the multiple stick, which was like a stick cream product that you could put on the eyes, cheeks and lips. You could sort of just like blend it everywhere with your finger. And I literally took this, this multiple stick, which was the color was called Malibu. It was this beautiful, like, dusty mauve rosy color and I put a little bit on the back of my hand and did like this and this and this patted it on her like lips eyelids cheeks lips and put a little bit of brown mascara and that was all I did and but that was sort of like I survived that moment and I was like oh my god I just like touched my first supermodel I just like did makeup on my first supermodel and then you know yeah so then I think as I as I started to work with other you know, well-known models and, and, you know, actresses and celebrities. And I, I had that moment already under my belt. So I felt like I could keep my composure, but I mean, when I look back and I still, I think I'm in this transition moment now of sort of changing the way that I've been, I'm interfacing with the industry. And I, you know, I think about all of the things that I've had an opportunity to do and the things, you know, where my work has taken me and who I've been able to work with and meet. And I, sometimes most of the time just can't believe it i mean how fortunate and how lucky i am yeah well it's been quite a life now <laughs> tell me about shishado um it, it there was a transition somewhat naturally from nars but that's a was a very huge job yeah it was it was it was an interesting thing you know as i got as i as i learned from my time at nars and and started to work you know, obviously more closely with Shiseido and working with the the team in Japan and um, seeing this sort of scaling process of like what NARS was as this sort of indie darling brand with a lot of buzz and a lot of awareness and a lot of love, um, you know, how, how through Shiseido's partnership and help sort of elevated and helped that helped the NARS brand grow. I, of course, developed relationship with Shiseido as the, as the parent company and you know, as a makeup artist and as a lover of beauty, a lover of Japanese culture, um, Shiseido was always one of the most iconic brands to me as a young person. I, re- I you know, we had one high end sort of shopping destination in St. Louis, which was Plaza Frontenac, which, you know, the rapper Nelly made famous years later in one of his songs. But, um, you know, Shiseido was carried, I think, at either Saks or Neiman Marcus at, at, at Plaza Frontenac. And it, you know, I bought a cleanser. I'll never forget it. it was Pureness Cleanser, which was sort of the line that was more for like a teenager or for like slightly acneic skin. And it was like, I bought it, I was probably 14, 15, as like this like, you know, coveted prestige product. So when Shiseido acquired NARS, I was like, this is incredible. And as a makeup artist, also watching fashion TV, looking at the pages of Allure, um, trying to find what all of these makeup artists that I admired, like what was in their kits at the time, the Shiseido eyelash curler, Shiseido cleansing oil, Shiseido moisturizer, um, some Shiseido color. So Shiseido was like, you know, to me was like the pinnacle and the peak of like the best quality and this fusion of art and science and products that I wanted to have in my kit. Because if I had those great products in my kit, the people that I were working with would trust me. The people that I was working with would feel safer with me because I'm using these reputable products that they know. So, you know, long story long, um, to have have the opportunity then 
uh, you know, which I started talking with the Shiseido group in 2015, 2016 about this opportunity to reimagine the Shiseido makeup line and that I, you know, that they put the trust in me and that they believed that I would be able to carry out this job and to be able to um, put my stamp on a brand, you know, a heritage brand like that with such history and such celebration of artistry and to like join the ranks of artists like Serge Luton and, you know, Dick Page and Tom Pichot and Stefan Moray um, and obviously Francois Nars and Kevin Aquan. It was, it was insane. Like I, I couldn't believe it. And it was, you know, it was never lost on me that it felt like the pinnacle of what I could do in my career in a certain way. Um, I don't know that I knew it at the time that it was like the end of a chapter, but it felt very much like this is the sort of um, manifestation of all of these things that I could have thought in, in that way. And, um, you know, I'm so proud of what I was able to do with Shiseido and the products that I was able to create and the, you know, the, the messages that we were able to communicate through our creative, um, you know, campaign imagery and ambassadors. And it's meant so much to me, um, again, to like be able to leave my mark on, on such an iconic brand and to be part of that history, 150 plus years, um, to be a part of that is just incredible. I, I, I it blows my mind just to still think about it. So you created the whole like if, if we walk into a, a store what would you have created so i mean with so our team it was interesting because when we came on in 2016 to work on the project and we relaunched the brand in 2018 it was the first time that the brand headquarters in tokyo um had done any sort of like product development or marketing led initiatives or creative outside of the brand hub in Tokyo. And the reason that we were, I guess, allowed to do this, our team was allowed to do this was because of our pedigree as experts in our respective field. So me coming in from like with like an artistry and an education and a color direction background and my partner, you know, my partners in marketing, my partners in product development, my partners in display and merchandising and creative, you know, there were about seven or eight of us, I guess, at the time, it was a small team. And we were given the reins to reimagine because, you know, I think makeup and beauty in color cosmetics specifically is, you know, the innovation is always most, I mean, has really come from the United States and really come from Canada. It hasn't really come from, maybe come from Asia or maybe come from, from Europe in the same capacity. And we were charged with taking this, this global brand that had beautiful makeup products, but that were lensed through a slightly more domestic Japanese lens. So we were really, you know, our task was to make Shiseido makeup more globally inclusive and relevant and um, performance-based and more competitive with what was happening in the market, you know, even with brands within the portfolio like NARS and Laura Mercier at the time and, and these sort of artistry-led brands, we didn't try to make Shiseido an artistry-led brand. It wasn't a pro brand or a makeup artist brand, but it was taking those, those tenets of performance and texture and um, finish and expression and identity and all of that and infusing it into the brand. So, um, you know, I guess what I, what I directly had, I guess my hand in is, um, shade development. Um, so like all of the colors that you actually see creating the colors and naming the colors and working with the packaging designers on the silhouettes of the packaging, and then working with how we would use and talk about the product. So building the language for Shiseido makeup. What, what do we talk about? What do we sound like? Um, and then what that looked like in imagery. So in our um, campaigns, doing the makeup for the campaigns and working with our creative teams to concept how the product would um, translate into communication. So, um, you know, what that looked like for our campaigns. And and for us, Shiseido, I think what what is important and to honor the brand's history of 150 years and, and always having the product come first, I always felt like it was very important to 
fig figure out a way to communicate the product's um, essence. How do you communicate what the product is? So my brain works from a, a story and a narrative and from inspiration. So if I'm doing an eyeshadow line, which was called Pop Powder Gel Eyeshadow, those colors were inspired by, you know, the automatopoeia that I experienced as a foreigner in Japan. So it was my also my homage to Japanese culture and trying to understand the language. So I used Japanese words to describe feelings that were things that I could sort of start my communication, like, um, you know, shari shari or kura kura or uh, doki doki. And these are like sort of automatopoeia words in the Japanese language that don't really translate to language to English, but they mean like the sound of your heartbeat or walking on ice or uh, sparkling light. And then that, words. <laughs> that was sort of my inspiration for wow. the development. And then when we had the product and we moved it into creative and the campaign, it became this sort of like ASMR, like synesthesia experience of color with Hunter Schaefer, sort of like saying the Japanese words and experiencing the color in a, in a, in a, in a way. And that was all my reference and my way of interpreting the very iconic work of Serge when, when he was the creative director for Shiseido. So it, again, that, you know, as, as I think creatives always talk about connecting the dots of reference and trying to create your own narrative that honors the past and, you know, pays homage to something that we've all seen, but, but then presented in a new way. Wow. This is so fascinating. <laughs> you? You're so darn smart, James. I mean, to be able to conceive of, it's it's also abstract and to intuit a narrative when you're dealing with colors that are in a a, a pot of makeup I, it's brilliant <laughs> brilliant it's really interesting it's, it's interesting i think that's the thing that i learned the most from my time at nars and working with francois and and what he is so just masterful and genius at is the narrative and i think that when you know we think about different creatives in, 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 in all fields, in art, in music, in film, in fashion, um, in television, you know, it is always the story. And the story is what fosters the engagement and the connection. Um, I think without a story and without that spark of inspiration, um, why, 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 why is there another lipstick or another sweater or another ceramic vase or another painting? Like without the narrative, um, it doesn't mean anything. And, and the narrative and the story is what fosters the engagement. And, you know, you think about like, you know, I mean, your, your incredible moments like backstage with like Galliano. I mean, a perfect example, right? Like, like, like um, what a narrative storyteller, you know, like it's, it's, you're creating these other worlds that then allows the person, you know, the, the consumer or the client to enter into. And I think what I learned with, with, with my time with Francois and Nars was how important the narrative was in the work that you do. And mm -hmm. he always said, if you don't have a reason to do something, if you don't have, if there's no why, don't do it. Like if you, you know, why put foundation on somebody or, you know, a red lipstick or a strong eyebrow on someone, if you don't have a reason to do it, if you're not, if you're not trying to make Linda look like Sophia Loren, why are you putting the eyebrow on? So it's, I learned so much about character and persona and narrative um, from his work and not directly being there, but like his work with Mizell and those iconic moments, you know, with Italian Vogue specifically in that sweet spot of like 89 to 92, 93. I learned years later about how he created those images and what he meant and what Steven was referencing and what they aimed to do. You know, his documentary that he did um, last year um, Francois Nars documentary was so beautiful because it, I think it really showcases, oh, it, it gives you insight into this abstract that you mentioned, because again, I think for most creative, it's like an assemblage, it's a collage, you know, I have, a, I, I'm, I'm looking literally on the opposite wall off camera is like a giant cork board where I just like tear things and print things and pull things and put it all into this visual storyboard that then helps me channel the work that I have to do. Um, so it is abstract, but it's also like, it's, it's again, it's like, it's forming the narrative, it's forming the vocabulary, it's creating a way 
through whatever your medium, if it's makeup, if it's clay, if it's fabric, if it's, if it's storytelling, if you're writing, if you're a filmmaker, you have to organize your thoughts and build your language. So then you can do the work. And the, for me, that process is what I love. I love the process of the creating and the forming the narrative more than anything. That's, that's what's the most exciting for me. You have to be so in touch with what's happening in the world. You just, it kind of blows my mind, all the things you must be picking up. Well, but beauty, I think beauty and art and, you know, I think sort of back to how we started the, this conversation and what you mentioned earlier, I think like beauty is what we all are in pursuit of. And beauty is the way that we can make sense of the world around us. I think beauty is like that great equalizer, um, especially in times of turmoil and conflict, which there's nothing but that right now in our, in our lives. There's nothing, there, the world around us is, is filled with it. And I think beauty helps us make sense of the world around us. You know, when we can see the beauty of you know, the first spring flowers blooming in your yard or a beautiful sunset or smell an incredible fragrance or hear a beautiful piece of music or see an incredible piece of artwork or film that moves us, like it, it reminds us of our humanity. And for me, I think, and for most of us that love beauty, you know, it makes, it helps us make sense of the world. So James, you were at the pinnacle for sure. And you've decided to do, I guess what they call a pivot that's very exciting. <laughs> Do you want to tell me all about it? So yes, uh, so it's in it's interesting because, you know, I think, um, you know, I mean, in, 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 in all honesty and transparency, like we, when we came onto the Shiseido project, it, we came on as a project, we didn't know how long it was going to last. And I think for many, um, you know, for many different reasons, you know, the, 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 the climate of the beauty industry, the brand's sort of priority with like skincare over the makeup category, we sort of knew that our time was coming to an end at Shiseido, which gave me an incredible opportunity to think about what my next move was. And, you know, to be honest, having a tenure with a group like, like Shiseido, I was with the Shiseido group for 22 years. It's a big part of my, um, it's a big part of my career. It's a big part of my, in, you know, my imprint and my ethos and all of that. So, when I knew that the time was coming to an end at Shiseido Makeup and I was thinking about what I wanted to do, do next, I knew that I did not want to go and do what I had done for another brand. And I, I didn't even think that it would be possible for me to inject my love and my personality and my passion into another brand just for the sake of you know having a job. And I moved to Connecticut um, from Manhattan in the spring of 21 and have found such solace in not being in the city and having a different, um, you know, daffodils growing in the yard and sunsets and being sort of, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to live in a really beautiful place that's sort of isolated and um, surrounded by nature. And since I moved out here, I was, I've been thinking about a way that I could sort of firm my roots a little bit more in the community here. And, um, you know, my partner, Greg, and I, um, he comes from the fashion side. He actually comes from a, a, a long career in model management and model development, you know, working for agencies like D uh, DNA and Elite, and um, which is really interesting because our paths crossed many times before we actually like collided with one another. But we had been talking, knowing sort of that like things were going to change for me and thinking about what I wanted to do. And he had he had already sort of like had one foot out of the industry, I think, for his own reasons and his own disillusionment and wanting to do something different. So we decided um, that we are going to open a multi-category store and gallery space in Kent, Connecticut, which is very near where we live. Um, and it's called Peggy Mercury. And we're like literally in the in the in the the thick of it right now, um, scheduling a May 8th um opening. Um, but we're really excited. Like we we're sort of taking our love of image making um and community building and making that our number one objective with what we're doing with Peggy. We want this to be a space that inspires imagination and dreaming and connecting with beautiful things and in, you know 
fragrance, skincare, cosmetics, ceramics, glass, handmade fabric, um, uh, art. Um, we want it to really be a multi-sensory, uh, I guess, multi-sensory laboratory or multi-sensory experience where the community, um, our community and the community that we're going to be taking part of can experience beauty, I think, uh, more than anything. And wow. for Greg and I, it's been a real dream come true, a lifelong dream, again, that we maybe didn't have the words for and that we didn't have the vocabulary for, but to build a space for everyone, um, a safe space that inspires and promotes dreaming and imagination. I think about like, you know, again, access to those places growing up, you know, having one bookstore, having, you know, one library and thinking about a place where somebody can come in and, and smell something beautiful, have a cup of coffee, sit down and look at some great books, view amazing art, experience ceramics and handmade object, and just promote a conversation with like-minded people that love, um, love beauty, I guess, really at the, at the, at the, at its, at its core. That's what we're trying to do. Wow. This is so exciting. That's going to be a place people just, they're going to want to be there. They're going to feel good. That's yeah. the goal. And, and it, and, and I think that we're halfway there because it feels that way for us. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, like that, that process, the building, the narrative, Crafting the story is the part that I love the most. Um, and it's the part that Greg loves the most. And it's the part that we're we're in right now. But we feel like it's a place that we want to go to. And it, we, we, we know the people that we're working with and that we're partnering with really closely on like making fixtures and furniture and the partners and brands that we're working with all feel the same way. So it's, again, we're, we're building community um, already and that is our biggest objective um you know it's what it's what i've done in my career it's what greg's done in his career um in a different way with a different lens and with a different objective but it's all the same applied skills that we have um we're just yeah. we're just putting them in action in a different way for something that's much more personal and yes. that you can really completely be in control of it's interesting how like how 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 your journey i guess takes you, you know, where it takes you. Um, you know, I think so much about like your story too, you know, just like how, how you're revisiting a moment in your, in your life and in your career that was so, I think you're realizing how impactful it has been for people and for us, this whole generation of fashion executives and creatives that were so inspired by the work that you did to be oh. able to come back later and connect you connecting those dots well, see how it, like you and hearing it is incredibly <laughs> incredible for me, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just so interesting how like our journeys, you know, I think the stories that we tell and the, and our, the journeys that we're on personally, um, if we're lucky enough and if we're open enough, and maybe if we're generous enough with our, our, our time and our talents and our, and our, and our, um, experience with other people, we get to get that back on in some capacity on the other end. And I think that's what this next venture for us really feels like. It's a way for us to give back, but it's also a way for us to get something that's always been there in a different way and, you know, maybe pay it forward in some capacity and, or just, again, connect the dots in a different way. You know, we see where it, we, we see where it takes us. You know, I'm, I'm, I started my career when I was 19 years old, I'm almost 50. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I live in the middle of nowhere, you know, everything about my sphere of influence and my life is different now. And my, I think my interest, my interests haven't changed, but my environment certainly has. And I think my objectives um, and what I think will bring me joy and make me happy has changed. So I think, you know, we're lucky as humans to be able to have the opportunity to change our minds, to want something different, to try something else. And that's, I think, what 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 I'm most excited about right now. Well, it takes guts too. I really admire you, but I'm really inspired. I know it's gonna, it's gonna be great. Tell me about the name. Yeah, so Peggy Mercury, um, you know, I think when Greg and I were talking about it and we were sort of getting this in, um, taking it from our brains, or from that visual mood board, or from like the photos that we had been sending back and forth to each other on Instagram for a year, when we started like putting it together, um, 
we we knew that we didn't want to call what we were doing. We didn't even know what we were doing at the time, to be honest. We knew it was something, but we didn't really know what it was. We didn't want to call it like James and Greg or like Bamer and Fricky or whatever. We wanted it to be, um, I guess, a name that would create an identity. And when we actually, you know, after years of knowing each other through the industry, um, I think from afar, we started communicating uh, with each other, which what led to our relationship um, via a post that Greg had posted about Peggy Guggenheim. And Peggy, for both of us separately, has always been a muse, um, you know, for what she did as a patron for the art world and what she did to champion the weird and the new and to present something that was counter culture and alternative. Um, we were always inspired and also just her eccentricity and her character and all of that. So we sort of started our relationship. Um, he had just rewatched the Peggy Guggenheim documentary and I was reading a, a, a biography at the time. And it was just one of those moments of serendipity. So Peggy to, to Peggy Guggenheim and then Mercury, we didn't want to call it Peggy Guggenheim. Obviously we can't trademark that. And the foundation in Venice would come after us. So mm -hmm. we thought about Mercury as a way to make it seem like a stage name. And, and we were paying homage to the, the ruling planet and the material and the idea that Mercury is always fluid and viscous and ever-changing and shape-shifting. And also this very old like Victorian era slang that being mercurial meant being queer and that being mercurial is sort of uh, being bitchy. So we thought that just Peggy Mercury made it sound like this character that had meaning to us. And then to people who maybe didn't get it right away, they're like, oh, who's Peggy Mercury? And it would it would prompt questions. Brilliant. Brilliant. I didn't know that that was that a connotation for the word Mercury. It's it's I had this weird this was this was actually um, it, again, one of my like weird obsessions. I think I'm always I'm I'm always very curious in like the origin of a word or like, you know, slang or, um, you know, like going back to what I was talking about, about the eyeshadows for Shiseido, like I was trying to infuse my very limited understanding of the Japanese language in a way that felt authentic to me. And I, I love that, th that slang and that sort of like subculture of language that people use. You know, there's a lot of it in queer culture. There's a lot of it in, you know, in fashion, how people speak about references or in film, how, you know, lighting, uh, lighting designers and, and grips and, and tech people talk about, you know, gobos and scrims and things that I don't understand. So it's, I'm always curious about these, like this reference and language. So, um, you know, Oscar Wilde is one of my personal heroes and, and I loved Oscar Wilde as, as a, as a kid and he, you know, Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman and, again, those, these icons of queer culture that were pioneering, like there's so much in that era and, and th there was so much bravery um, and so many, so many firsts. And I just, I, I don't remember where I came across it, but yeah, this idea of like, you know, being mercurial was, was actually a derogatory way to describe uh, a, a, a gay person. And again, this idea of being queer, which again, it's queer, the, the origin of the word queer is not just about sexuality and sexual or gender identity. It's about feeling othered. It's about being weird. It's about being a misfit. So for both of us, it, 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 it represents that. Fabulous name. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's going to be such a great space. So you're going to open in a few weeks. Yes. Yes. You've got Chris. signs. I think you're going to go do something about signs today. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we, we've been in the process. Yeah. All week we've been, cause we're just now um, the, the, the sort of first phase of construction is done and we're waiting basically for like the, the, the top layer of sealant um, on the floors to dry so that we can go in and start fixturing. So building our cabinets and our shelving and installing signage and, you know, hang bars and racks and all of that stuff. So it's the fun part taking taking all of this visual ephemera and putting it into fabrication and production and then actually putting it in the physical space. It's like, it literally is like the physical manifestation of a dream and it's, it's wild. It's, it, it feels like a, um, a rare privilege to be able to do it.